did I end up in Montana when my wife and I fled Liberia? We got on a ship and didn't know where we were going. And we ended up, and uh, the second day on the ship, we found out that the ship was docking in Ghana. And so we decided that, yes, we'll get down in Ghana because in Ghana, they speak English. So we were able to get down in Ghana. And in Liberia, I taught for an international organization called the SOS Children's Village. And in almost every country, you have the SOS Children's Village. And when we landed in um, Mm -hmm. Ghana, I decided to locate the SOS Children's Village. When I found it, they asked me to identify myself. And for the first time in my life, I could not because in Liberia, we didn't travel with ID cards or anything for fear. We will be linked to someone another person hates and then we will be murdered. So we didn't travel ID cards. And so when the uh, director asked me to identify myself, I couldn't. I had no ID card, I had no passport, I had nothing. But some kids had come from the village and he sent for them and they recognized me and they identified me. But when they saw me, they immediately broke down crying. And I was confused because I thought they would be happy to see me. But then when I asked to use the restroom and I went into the restroom and found out why they were crying. When they knew me, I was 175 pounds. When they saw me that day, I was 92 pounds. And um, I was basically dying. But to run, to fast forward, after three months of being in Ghana, my wife says, let's go to America. And I said, how do you suppose we do that? She said, well, let's go to Montana. I said, wait, you gotta make up your mind. We go to Montana or we go to America. She said, Montana is in America. But um, my wife had come to Montana as an African exchange student and she lived with a host family. And so she was able to contact a host family and they were instrumental in getting a, a full scholarship to do nursing, but I couldn't come with her. And two weeks before she left, she, um, we found out she was pregnant. And, but we talked about it and she was, she left and I stayed back in Ghana and I had to register with the UNHCR and go through that whole process. And that process took me two years and seven months. When I first saw my daughter, she was turning two years old. And so you see, I I live by three things. When, uh, when I talk to people, I say, look, I'm still not really successful. I think I can do much more. So I want others to listen to this because I always tell people you have, all of us have talents that we can use, but we have to take one. We have to take the risk to use that talent. And that's where I came in. Cause when I came to Montana, I didn't know anybody. That I only knew, I knew two people. In fact, I knew one because I didn't even know my daughter. I knew my wife, and that's the only person I knew. But I was able to take the risk and started coaching soccer. And then I started singing in my church choir. And then I started, I mean, I I got involved in everything. So I took those risks. If you can take the risk, people will get to know who you are. People will get to, they'll start to get to know your culture and, and what you're about. The second thing is you must get involved in your communities. Do not shy away. Get involved. Even if you know it or not, you know what? Every moment is a teachable one. Everything you get into, you will learn one way or the other. And finally, the third thing I always tell people is we must learn to step outside of our comfort zones. We are very comfortable. Once we're comfortable, we tend to just become relaxed and complacent. No. Step outside of your comfort zone. And my son challenged me to that. Because after living in this country for so many years, he, he was at the university, a junior student at the University of Montana. And he drove all the way an hour and a half to me and said, Dad, we need to talk. And I said, what about? He said, I don't want mom to hear. And I became really alarmed. So we went out and he said, dad, I think it's time for you to get into politics. 
And that's why he didn't want mom to hear because his mom didn't, she hates politics. So I said, well, 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 slow down. I'm not qualified to get into this politics. So don't even go there. He said, dad, you are. I said, so what makes me qualify? He said, dad, you're, you're smart, you, you're educated, and you're personable. That's all you need to be in politics. I said, nah, I can't do it. What do I need to do? He said, I don't know what you need to do, but you have friends who know will help you. And um, we invited three sets, uh, three couples over for dinner. And after eating, I told them, I said, hey, guys, I'm thinking about getting into politics. Um, what do you think? And one of the ladies, she, she yelled, exclaimed, oh, my God, this is fate. This is fate. And I said, what do you mean? She said, just last night, we were talking about asking you to run for mayor. And, I'm, and then my son put his hand up and said, oh, my God, if this is not a sign, then what else? And so I asked him, I said, what do I need to do? And they said, well, you need to first talk to your family about it. So I talked to them and they all voted. My wife voted against it, but she lost the vote. And so we um, so we started the process. And believe me, that process was very uncomfortable because Two weeks prior to starting the process, uh, uh, the city government had taken down the last Confederate monument in the Northwest. And it was a hot, hot topic. And if I had to go and knock on people's doors, I was afraid that's what they would want to talk about and they would miss the bigger picture. But I banged and banged and I accepted the challenge from my son. But not only that, I took the risk. And I didn't, quite frankly, I got in only because growing, when my kids were growing up, I told them one day I'll get into politics. One day I'll get into politics. And for my son, that day was now. I needed to get in it. And I told him, I said, why do you think I will win? He said, because you're in the right spot, the right time, and you will win. So I gathered a campaign team. And we started uh, uh, deliberating. We will meet three times. We will meet three times a week, and we started knocking on doors, introducing myself to people. And surprisingly, not one person slammed the door in my face, as I thought they would, because you know. And another thing, I told my son, I said, "Are you aware who I am?" He said, "What do you mean?" I said, and then I did this to him. I said, "Look at me." You know, because where we live, we're far and few in between. I mean, it's zero, 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 zero point one percentage, you know. So he said, Dad, they won't look at the color of your skin. Do it. And I was surprised they didn't. I knocked on thousands of doors and not once, even people who said, I cannot vote for you, I will vote for your opponent because we grew up together, they still welcome me in their homes. And I was just blown away by the warmth. And on election, you know, we did all that we could do. What scared me the most was when we had to report our first quarter earnings, I outraised the incumbent. That scared me because I told my son, oh, my God, these people really think I can do this job. I was scared. <laughs> he said, yes, Dad, you can do it. I said, no, I can't. But when I outraised him, and I outraised him from people in the community, no outside. And uh, on election day, I, I was scared. I refused to watch TV. I refused to go on the Internet. I didn't want to hear the results. And then my son comes running in after they pulled out the first set of results. Dad, 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 you're leading, you're leading. I said, by how much? He said, oh, by 37 votes. And I'm like, God, no, that's not a lead. But as the night wore on, I never went below the incumbent. I always increased my lead, always increased my lead, always increased my lead. And by midnight, I got a first call from US Senator John Tester congratulating me. I said, whoa, they're still counting votes. He said, this is not my first rodeo. You know, I think you've got this. And it never really hit me. And then Huffington Post called and said, how does it feel to make history? I said, what are you talking about? 
They say, you're not aware. I say, aware about what? And he said, you just made history. And then I said, hold on one minute. I put him on mute. I called my son. I said, did we just make history? He said, yeah, dad, you're the first African-American in Montana history. I said, why didn't you tell me? He said, dad, your head would have gotten so big and you would have lost focus. So I didn't want that to happen. And so I got back on the line with Huffington Post. I said, yeah, I know we made history. I'm the first this, that, that. And within that night, I had six or seven interviews with news media all over the place, but I had not received that conciliatory call from the incumbent. And so the next morning, I got a call from the governor, the lieutenant governor, the congressman, and it is, and it had it all. And by nine o'clock, I still hadn't received that call. And so I told my wife, come on, let's go have some coffee. We went to Starbucks. And while having coffee, that call came in. And he congratulated me. Congratulations, uh, Wilma. Um, this is Mayor Jim Smith, and I'm happy you won. And I want you to know that whatever I can do to make a smooth transition, I'll be happy to do that. And that's when I knew I was the mayor. Everybody called didn't matter. That was the call I was waiting for. And so um, from there, it was smooth sailing, you know, because I, we, I had a really, really great team. And um, I still remember uh, the clerk of uh, the commission when I went to my office the first time. And I uh, said, so when do, when do we have our first meeting? She said, oh, tomorrow night, Mayor. I said, uh, so what am I supposed to do? She said, you lead the meeting. You're the head. I said, yeah, but what am I supposed to do at the meeting? She said, Mayor, there's an agenda you have. I said, look, I didn't go to school to be mayor. I need your help. And this clerk had been working with us for 28 years. So she had, she knew everything. She said, okay, may I will create a cheat sheet for you. You follow it to the letter, you will be fine. And she created that cheat sheet. And places where I had to pause, she put pause. Places where I had to <laughs> stop, I saw a big red stop. So um, when I got to the meeting, Everybody welcomed me, the commissioners and everybody. And I followed that cheat sheet. At the end of my first meeting, people came to me and said, were you a mayor before? And I'm like, no. So how did you manage? Because everybody was watching to see me stumble. But what I'm saying that I had enough sense, and not, well, I had enough courage to seek help. When I knew I didn't know it, I went out of my comfort zone and asked for help. And it happened. So after I became mayor, this is how beautiful my community is. I received a letter, an email rather, from a, a, a third grader. And this third grader wrote, Dear Mayor Collins, my name is William Collins. Would you come to my school and tell me how you got your name? So I responded, dear William, I will. I'm not sure when, but I will come to your school. Within a couple of weeks, I had some time and I drove over to his school. And I went to the office. I said, I'm here to meet William Collins. The principal said, oh, just go down to the third grade class down the hall. So I walked into the third grade class, look around, and I didn't see an African-American kid. So I started to backpedal. And the teacher said, may I help you, Mayor? I said, nah, I'm looking for William Collins. And she said, oh, there's William, blonde, blue eye kid, right? And I said, William, my name is, he said, I know who you are. So he said, I said, do you still think we're related? He said, how, do you, how did you get your name? I said, William, my dad gave me this name. And he said, oh, my God. My dad gave me my name. We are related. And this guy gave me the warmest hug. And then he took selfie and sends it to his, he sent it to his grandparents, his mom. He met his relative, Mayor Collins. And that was beautiful. And then I received a letter, an email from his grandpa. Dear Mayor Collins, I'm sure by now you know we're not related. 
And then I responded, dear Mr. Collins, I'm not related to you, but I'm darn right related to William. So, you know, but you see, that's the kind of community that this happening, that's the kind of community I live in, warm, loving, as long as you can take, you can get out of your comfort zone, you can take risk and you can get involved in your community, you will be fine. Thank you.